Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nikon Creators Hour. I'm your host, Mike Corrado. I've been with Nikon for 35 years and been taking pictures for over 40 years. Some of those pictures rock photos, and we are going to be with Todd O'Young, rock photographer extraordinaire. How are you, Todd? I'm doing well, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to talk about talk shop with you. Welcome to the Creators Hour. Uh, those of you tuning in, if you've seen any other interviews or this is your first time back, we try to create these really nice conversations with epic photographers, in this case, Nikon Ambassador Todd O'Young, to talk about their defining images within their career uh, and uh, to give us the backstories on those images and, and really get the skinny on what it was like to actually be there, the good, the bad, the ugly, what the surprises were, what, what the challenges were. So we're going to get into all of that uh, over the next hour. So Again, thank you for being with us. Uh, I met you several years ago, Todd. Um, we run in certain circles together in the rock and roll industry. That's right. And I know his name is going to come up throughout the interview, Chris, because I actually met Chris, your brother, first, uh, because the two of you work together. But I met him at an iHeartRadio event that we were covering through Nikon and, uh, you know, a, a program that we were working on. And you guys happen to be there as well. So, um, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about you and your brother throughout because I know you work together. But before we get into that, um, I really want you to take a step back to not too long ago um, when you first picked up a camera and what that was like to you and why you've moved into a career in photography, uh, specifically performance arts or, or stage performances. Sure. Well, I bought my first camera in 2002. I was an art student and I figured that a camera was simply a good tool to have. And for whatever reason, I got this idea in my head. I saved up money from working a summer job. I bought a Nikon FM3A. I wanted to learn on a manual film camera. I just thought that, you know, I drove a, a manual, you know, stick shift car. I thought that a manual camera was the way to go. And I loved it. You know, I shot a ton of black and white film, a lot of, you know, it's like, getting out there, shooting anything and everything, my life, my friends, doing travel photography when I traveled, and I loved it. And then in 2004, I saved up money, bought a Nikon D70 as my first digital camera, and just kind of never looked back. I, To be honest, I haven't shot a frame of film since. I've just been 100% digital and just kind of like went in deep with it. And just have been, you know, it's, I've loved shooting Nikon ever since. Did you start uh, in school in photography? Is that what, you know, where you got your learning or do you consider yourself self-taught? I did start shooting in college. I was, you know, in, again, in art school. Um, I didn't major in, in photography. I majored in, in design and visual communications. And I started doing a lot of photography to use in design projects because I was just, you know, you need images for these things. And it was just easier to shoot them myself um, on, you know, um, and make them. So I started doing that. And then, you know, I was shooting you know, after college, kind of shooting anything and everything I could do, um, macro photography, travel, shooting weddings, and so forth. And, um, and we'll, we'll get into this in the, in the first image, but just took my camera to a concert and was bitten by this bug. It was like, you know, being struck by lightning and just fell mm -hmm. in love with photographing live music. I, I know that feeling. You know, we, um, we had uh, jumped into the naming rights of a theater here on Long Island called the Jones Beach Theater. And I was asked to go to a press event to teach press photographers how to shoot pictures at a concert and said, well, I photograph sports. I photograph wildlife. I've never photographed a concert before, but I'm happy to go in there and do that. And you are right. You catch this bug right away that you feel the vibrations, you feel the thump of the bass, you feel the woofers, you feel all of it. And you hear a crowd behind you that's so excited to be there yeah, because it's, it's that's their favorite band or a band they want to follow. And it's just a different world. And again, we, we run in these similar circles, so we'll have a lot to talk about you know, especially with those pictures. And yes, your first picture is your first concert. So we all start somewhere. And I know we're going to talk about tips about rock photography or concert photography along the way. I do want to stipulate one thing, though. And in the wake of this pandemic, uh, we know a lot of concert photographers, a lot of people trying to work. It's, it's a tough, tough time because there are no venues that are taking, you know, acts in. None of the acts really want to perform, you know, in venues right now. So until that opens up, probably much later in this year or next year, you know, uh, it's a difficult situation, so we respect that and we, we understand that. So, again, this, the intent of these Creators Hour interviews are to inspire and educate because there will be a time when we're back out there shooting concerts, and um, we want everybody to be inspired by the work Todd has done. It is brilliant work in combination with his brother working together and running a business. It's not an easy business to be in in rock and roll, uh, and we'll talk about how you tour with bands and things like that. So um, I say we jump into the pictures right now if that works for you. Yeah, let's do it. 
um, because we've got a lot of great stories to talk about. And, and I want to talk about the behind the scenes and the things that goes on because, you know, you see a lot of stage performances and you do see a lot of pictures of the bands on stage, but you're going to be able to take us into a world of a band that you travel with, you know, to show what happens behind the scenes and some of the other opportunities, which to me are the far more interesting pictures uh, from any concert photographer. But let's start off here and talk about where your career started. You mentioned that this is the first concert you ever photographed. What's going on here and what's in your mind as you're doing this? So I went to this concert basically kind of by accident. I don't know where my, my best friend Brad invited me to a show and he and I have very different types of music. I was more kind of into indie rock. He was into kind of like country folk, bluegrass. And he invited me to this show and I had no idea who the bands were. And I figured I'd just bring my camera to entertain myself. I figured if I didn't like the music, I could have fun by, by photographing the bands. And um, this is Scott Avid of the Avid Brothers. And we were playing to about maybe 50 people at a small club called Off Broadway in St. Louis. And now the Avid Brothers are, are way more you know, big. They're playing festivals and headlining. But back then, they're just playing to about yeah, 50 people in a small smoky dive bar. And I, we were in the front row, just in a, a seated at a table. And I was, you know, just, just kind of snapping off photos during the concert. And these, they were the openers. They weren't even headlining at this point. And something about working with the stage lighting and the limited time and the gestures and these fleeting moments and capturing that on stage was electrifying. It was just, you know, I remember the next day downloading the photos and going through them and thinking like, this is it. This is what I want to do. It's like no more weddings, no more whatever. Like I'm just, I just want to shoot rock and roll. Like I want to shoot live music. It's, it's, it's an amazing feeling too. And again, I, I take that step back to that feeling. There's almost with every concert, a renewed energy, just like that, especially if you've never photographed the band before because it's unique. And for those out there that never shot a concert before, what Todd's referring to in limited times Sometimes you get three songs from a group. Sometimes you get two songs. In many cases, you get one song. And I remember being asked to go photograph Janet Jackson. I'm not kidding you. It was the first 30 seconds of the first song. That was yeah, imposed as the rule. And, you know, um, the concert was canceled. But there are all kinds of conditions that you have to deal with that are out of your control that you can change on the fly. So as I'm sure you learned, Todd, you got to be thick skinned for this, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and. The flip side of that is that people always ask, oh, how do you get into concerts? How do you start shooting live music? And they want to start shooting at venues like Madison Square Garden or, you know, wherever. Um, but the reality is that shooting local and starting with these small bands that have no song limits, you know, is, is a huge way and the best way to get into photographing live music because you're going to get more access. You're going to be able to have more time um, and to make better images and to practice. And that's more, what, that's what this picture represents, right? A concert that you shot locally that you had a lot of freedom with. Yeah, this is a band called the Dillinger Escape Plan. And this is a band where, you know, talk about electric. They're, they run around like they're on fire when they're performing on stage. Um, and this is the guitarist, Jeff Tuttle. And this is um, a small venue in, in uh, Soji, Illinois. Maybe, maybe there might have been like 300 people at this concert. And again, I love photographing these small shows because you can get right up to the front of these low stages, kind of get these images, make these images that put you in the front row. Um, when I photograph live music, I love to give people give viewers that impression of being in the front row, if, whether you're there um, and make you feel like you're, you know, you're right there. Um, so this is shot with the Nikon 14 to 24, one of my favorite lenses for live music and just getting in your face. This is shot with flash as well, which is something you could do at a small concert, which we would never be allowed to do at a larger venue. Mm -hmm. No, that's so true. And I was going to say, there's a balance of what you can and can't do. The advantage of the small club is you have more freedoms and you don't feel that pressure of time. But when you get to the bigger venues, typically, and, and I've always said this, that uh, if the light show in that venue is superb, you find the lighting director and you kiss them on the lips because without <laughs> that light, beer. your pictures suffer. Okay, you can buy them a beer. I won't kiss them on the lips. I'm just <laughs> saying. But you find that person and you praise because yeah. yeah. the whole architecture of lighting, the design and artistic elements of lighting uh, is so crucial to a great stage photo shoot, right, when, yeah. when they're on stage. On the one and end, so, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, on the one hand, it's, it's easy because it's, everything is kind of done for you, depending how you look at it. Like you have no control, you have limited access, you have no control of the lighting, no control of what the performers are doing. You, all you have to do is press the button. So on the one hand, it's either incredibly easy or like the most challenging in the world because you have no control and you just have mm -hmm. to focus on your timing, your luck and your opportunity. Mm -hmm. Is the, the use of digital a benefit to you? I found that through the years, especially now mirrorless, um, where mirrorless, you're looking through at exactly what you're seeing in the way of exposure. 
right? For the most part, Definitely. where, you know, even with DSLR, you, you know, you kind of knew after a while exactly where you should be based on lights and the formulas for aperture and shutter. Where do you typically go? Talk to us about your exposure mode and maybe some of the settings within the camera that you make. Sure. Um, I'll go in, I'll shoot in manual 100% of the time, just because with, with live music, because the contrast and the stage lighting is, is so different than most normal scenes, it's very easy for the muter to be potentially fooled. And having that control to both uh, execute the frame how I want it, the exposure how I want it, and also to take creative license to, to lighten mm -hmm. or darken scenes as I see fit, as opposed to the camera. Um, so I'll shoot in manual mode. I'll generally try for, for smaller venues, at least one you know, 200th of a second to try to freeze some motion. Um, if I'm shooting a larger venue, I feel like the technical specifications might, there's more scrutiny on it from a technical standpoint. So I'll generally try to shoot at maybe one 500th of a second to freeze even more motion for these really technically you know, crisp images, which is how I love to shoot. Um, I'll almost always shoot wide open, you know, generally with, with my F 2.8 zooms, my go-to lenses, 14 to 24, 24 to 70, and 70 to 200 are the, the holy trinity, trinity of what's in my bag. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, generally auto, I, um, maybe ISO between 1600 to 6400, depending on lighting. And I'll generally shoot in auto white balance just because the cameras are so good these days that rather than dial something in specifically because lighting is often changing, um, the cameras mm -hmm. do such a good job that I kind of just take that out of my brain. Don't have to worry about it. Set it to auto uh, white balance and kind of pretty much good to go and just tweak it in post if need be. Yeah, I found in a lot of concerts, there's so many colors bouncing around that white balance, you kind of, you feel confident that whatever's going to happen is going to happen well. And you're never looking for specific accuracy, I think, in color when it comes to that kind of performance, unless uh, the garb or wardrobe is something that they're asking you to photograph, it should be accurate. But mm -hmm. I go back to this point you make. I mean, for those of you that have asked this question before or thinking about this is start with small bands, go into local clubs, make friends with the owners of the clubs. Um, you know, give the band some photos to work with for the, the, the time you spend, because it's not like they're going to give you the big payday. Um, but I did that with my nephew's band uh, in small clubs and able to mount speed lights actually up in the rafters, you know, because it, the ceiling wasn't so high and, you know, on some pipes and, and be able to light it yourself. And it was a great learning experience for the fundamentals of all this until you're confronted with everything that you can't control. And I would think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the flash, they don't want that in the pit because it's distracting to the performers. Generally, yes. Um, and, and building relationships and working with smaller bands, you can kind of gain the trust to use flashes. And when I've done that, a lot of the times I've used flashes, you know, off-camera flash, CLS with a Nikon system, and I'll be using it throughout the set and the bands will actually be like, oh, did you use the flash? Because they don't actually, it, it's such a short duration. They're concentrated on, you know, hitting the notes, their own performance that a lot of times, despite the rules, they're actually not even noticing um, the off-camera flash particularly because it's, it's, you know, it's on the sides, it's on the periphery. Um, if it's on camera and it's right, you know, right up in their face, then yeah, they're, they're definitely going to notice and it's going to be an annoyance mm -hmm. and they're not going to look too fondly on that. Yeah, and, and I think that if it's the type of show where there's a lot of flashing lights and bouncing lights and moving lights, they're not going to care either. But when it's a performer solo staying or, you know, an individual uh, performing up there, it's definitely a distraction. So I definitely. see that. And one day I'm going to come up with the answer and watch it. A lot of people hopefully will chime in, uh, maybe ask you this uh, in your AMA after this, but... Um, why two th songs? Why three songs? Why are they trying to control it? You know, we, you and I both are uh, really close with uh, Robert Knight, um, yep. people like Robert and Lynn Goldsmith and Baron Woman, who we had a chance, Robert and Baron, to work with together uh, at the, one of the last big trade shows. And, um, you know, back then you bring in a camera, there were no rules, there were no restrictions. Yep. Uh, and now there seems to be layers of people you have to get through to get oh, yeah. credentials. So but many gatekeepers. Also, you brought up that great point before, too, and wanting to start off at Madison Square Garden. You know, to me, and maybe you agree, you have to, you have, to have the credentials to be there. You have to have the reason to be there. Yes. And, yeah. and, 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 a, and a publication that's looking for pictures, and that's the best thing to do is build your portfolio of work, right? Um, and, and I want I to throw something out there and give you a plug, but uh, you have a blog called ishootshows.com, right? And um, yeah. You guys, go to this place because it's the best place to learn about how to shoot and use lenses and light and things like that. So, and we're going to talk about some portraits you do too, but uh, a lot of rules here. And um, I, I would say that I, I feel like, I don't know, I'd like to ask is, what is your responsibility here when it comes to the performer? What are you trying to do for that performer? I always want to make them look the best. 
it's my job, I feel, to make them look like, you know, how you'd want to be seen. I want to make them look larger than life, like legends, like heroes. And if I, you know, you, any photographer knows this, you shoot a lot of images, not all of them are going to be good. In my, I feel like my responsibility as a photographer, it's not, you know, to bend the truth or, or to misrepresent things, but it's to show them the best possible light because that's both a benefit to them and it's a benefit to me. They're going to trust me to take that responsibility and look out for them. And thus, the next time I, you know, shoot the band, they'll say, oh, you know, they'll remember the great photos and maybe the, the, the ones that I didn't post, those are just as important. You know, people, you know, just like, let's say you're shooting a wedding, you're not, you're not going to post the photos of the bride with, you know, chewing, you know, with their mouth open or something like that. The same thing applies to, to, you know, people on stage. You want to make them look their best, um, to make them look, you know, like heroic and epic and just, you know, what the spirit of rock and roll is. Um, and you know, what, again, showing what you, the images you don't show are just as important as the ones you do in that regard. That, that's a key point. Cause I remember photographing Hart, and we talked about, you know, how many songs I could shoot cause I was working with them. And I actually told them I wouldn't shoot beyond the fifth song because I'm sure those ladies don't want to be represented as hot, sweaty messes towards the end of the concert, you know, which is going to happen outdoors at a venue, especially a summer venue like that. And I've actually seen some artists, some lead singers actually toss out photographers when bad pictures are taken because yeah. they take offense to the fact that something could go out there. But that's a great point of yours is make people look great and they'll come back and they'll hire you again e even better. So as we roll on, talk about this picture. I know it's a defining moment in your career. What's going on here? So this is Radiohead photograph in St. Louis. And for me, this was uh, 2008. And it was an important photo for me because this was my first big placement. Um, you know, shooting in St. Louis, I think I always, uh, to be honest, had a kind of a chip on my shoulder or just had this feeling that, you know, it wasn't LA, it wasn't New York. And it felt difficult to get recognition as someone in, in this kind of middle market, middle America. And I was syndicating images with an agency and had a double page placement in Spin Magazine uh, with this photo. And for me, it was a huge kind of confidence boost and a, and a feeling that I could achieve success kind of on my own terms where I was. And looking back, you know, I didn't take, I kind of took St. Louis for granted, my hometown for granted, because when I was growing up there, it was kind of the only place I'd lived. Um, but moving away, not now living in New York and Brooklyn, you know, St. Louis was this perfect mix where you had everything from the small clubs to the arenas and amphitheaters and stadiums. And it kind of had, it wasn't the biggest shows, you know, not, not all the shows, but it had most of them coming through. Like it had Radiohead here. And I think that for me, the takeaway is that it may not feel like it, but you may just be exactly where you need to be to make the images that help define you as a photographer. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think smaller intimate venues and that middle ground balance that you speak of is so important because so many people in the bigger venues, lots more security, and we'll talk about all that. Um, but, um, you know, uh, those intimate settings, one, you're a, a little bit closer. You, you can make different types of pictures. And then yet they're still big enough to give you great light. Um, yeah. and, and a good enough light show to get you to the exposures that you want. And like you said, sometimes you go with slower shutter speeds to create a little bit of motion, but obviously sharp pictures are sharp pictures and motion blur could be determined as something not so great because nobody knows what to look at. So it's got to be that perfect balance of sharpness and, and motion. But um, I, I love the color within this. And again, it may be out of your control, but you've captured it so well. And um, even if it's something that's done on auto white balance, it's always great to see the light show and some of the things on stage. So, but uh, first, first double truck in spin magazine, is that what it is? Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah. It was, it was mm -hmm. definitely, it was a special thing for me. And, and, and how does that make you feel? I mean, I, I know I remember my first picture published um, in horse racing as a double truck, but how do you feel? You open up that magazine and you see, you know, credit, copyright, Todd o. Young. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. It felt, it gave me so much confidence as a young photographer you know, and you know how, I mean, well, music photography is tough. You know how it is. Um, there's, it's fun. I mean, the way I think of it, it's like getting paid to eat pizza. I'll do it for free. I'll pay for the pizza. Um, so as a music photographer being, you know, getting to, to make images, to be paid for it, to make a career out of it, it's such a, an honor. And mm -hmm. to have an image recognized like this was just tremendous for me, starting out and kind of building my confidence and, and knowing that, you know, I was, you know, with a lot of, you know, so much rejection or people had been hitting me, had been hitting me up for images for free, um, you know, things like that, that to have something like this national kind of placement was, was tremendous. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at the performance, I, uh, when you have what, two songs, three songs, whatever it is, yep. what are the things you're keying in on? So tell me, Todd O'Young, you come in there, you know, you got three songs, you got Radiohead in front of you. 
what are some of the things you're thinking about that you got to check off your list to get done in a short period of time? It's a great question. I think it's just like a lot of, you know, like classic photojournalism. You're looking for your, you know, your, your medium, your tight, your wide and telling the story of the concert. It's not just about headshots or tight shots of the lead singer and that's all you photograph it's really it's telling the story of the show what's it like to be a fan there what's it like to be on the front row to have this access where you could you know to make people feel like they could reach out and touch the performers um it's about you know the crowd shots the performer shots um you know getting a, a great shot of every member of the band is super important for me um you know just kind of giving people an idea of what it's like to be there um, showing off the production, like this shot, this is, you know, not necessarily a photo that shows off, you know, Tom, you're super in depth, but it's, it shows off the production and the lighting for this particular tour was amazing. They had these like kind of LED lights that were really atmospheric and just gorgeous uh, and created this really wonderful experience. And so for me, that was important in capturing um, that part of the tour in this image. It, you bring up LED lights and I know certain lights wreak havoc for cameras at times. Uh, and slower shutter speeds would be the solution, probably. I kind of have a hard time when there's big boards in the back, like yep, video yep. boards. There are some super high quality video boards that translate so perfectly in pictures and then other ones that break up if you're not working at the uh, shutter speeds. How do, you, how do you overcome that kind of stuff? I generally, to be honest, I don't think I, I don't worry about it too much. I'm focused 100% on the performer and their you know, their pose, their action, if they look good, is it the right moment for them? If, if the worst thing about an image is that the LEDs in the background are, you know, there's a little flicker or there's, it's not fully lit up because of how the cycle is captured um, and the shutter speed relation, I, I'm okay with that, ultimately. It's the best mm -hmm. if it's fully lit up, it looks, you know, wonderful, but I'm really, I'll take the action and the emotion in, in the performer over anything else. Great point. Great point. Because those are the moments I think that matter the most. Um, but I would say as, a, as somewhat of a tip, watch the lines of those boards in the background, those video panels, because a lot of times they can strike the head or you can have a corner sticking out and it's really obnoxious in the background. But I, I think I've gotten to this point, like when I first started shooting concerts, willy nilly, I was just shooting everything and going crazy. And I think that's a smart thing to do just because you don't want to miss things. But when you do get to that point, I swear to God, tell me if this is true of you. It's like things are happening in slow motion and I'm watching light kick the back of the head. I'm paying attention and I'm not shooting. I spend more time now at a concert not shooting than I do shooting. Is that the same for you? Because you're looking at the nuances of what's happening. You've shot these faces before, but uh, are you slowing yourself down and looking for those moments and light and everything going on? Particularly with tour photography, yes. And I think as I shoot more and more, definitely, I feel like it goes from being maybe super opportunistic and kind of shooting whatever is in front of your camera, which you still have to do. But I think as I progress as a photographer, it, it, I take, it's more like being a hunter and I'm taking my time. It's like stalking your prey and waiting for either those serendipitous moments or the moments that you plan. And maybe you had some you know, image in your mind where you want you know, a light in the background to be right behind the singer's head and you align it up just right or you know, whatever the case may be. Or if you have a, you know, the lighting, or, that you've been researching, you know that a specific effect is going to take place and just waiting for that and being ready and getting the position. But definitely, um, I think it's both being opportunistic, but also planning and being able to be calculated and to execute the images you want in your vision. This, this is great. I feel like I'm following your career as it unfolds. You have your big, big spin debut photographed by Todd O. Young. And I, I just love this picture. And again, I, uh, anyone that's photographed Kiss before knows how fan friendly they are oh. and how close they are to photographers. Talk about this picture, where it was made, what lens did you use and, and, and what's that feeling that they give you some attention? It's amazing. I mean, like you said, it's like fishing with dynamite with Kiss because they're playing to the camera. They're, they're just hamming it up basically. Um, but this was a concert photographed in Kansas City at the Sprint Center and uh, speaking of my blog, I Shoot Shows, it was one of the very first big placements, or sorry, um, approvals that I got. I basically pitched the show to all the publications I was shooting for. No one wanted me to take, to take me up on it. And so as a latch, last ditch kind of Hail Mary effort, I emailed the publicist um, and applied through my own blog. And they kind of ran the numbers. I had enough viewers to satisfy them or readers. And they approved me the day of. It was probably about one o'clock in the, in the afternoon when I got the email. I drove, you know, about four hours one way from St. Louis, Missouri to Kansas City, shot the show for three songs, and then literally just got in the car and drove right back. And I had the biggest grin on my face because I could not wait 
to download the images and see what I got. Because as you can see, you know, it's like beautiful white lighting. It's like the definition of an arena rock show. Um, and you have, you know, Paul Stanley, Tommy Thayer here, um, just, you know, playing to the cameras. They're making sure that every single photographer in the pit gets their shot. They're right up to the edge. And it's, it's, it was electric. It was amazing. And probably one of the top five concerts um, of my career just because of how excited I was and how well the images turned out for me at that time. And I think it speaks a lot to what we were talking about before about the beauty of light and on the stage and the backlighting and the hair light that you can see on Paul and, and, um, you know, of course their costume, you know, they, I don't think they ever looked at themselves as the greatest performing band, but the greatest performance is yes, you know, in, in, in the way of talent versus the performance. And they certainly get crowds going. And of course they're on their last tour now, which I think is 40 years of the last tour um, and came through the garden and uh, uh, the Nassau Coliseum um, recently last year. And I got to work with the lovely Lynn Goldsmith, uh, who's really good friends with Gene Stanley. But you're right. They do want you to be able to take the picture. And I, I, I think I told you the story, but there was a moment at the stage in Jones Beach where a photographer leaned in in front of me. And Paul plays, plays over, pushes the guy back to then look into the camera. And, yeah. that, and that's rare, right? I mean, to, to be able to work with a, a, a band like that, that's pretty rare, no? Absolutely, definitely. Um, but it, it certainly moment. certainly helps make those those great great pictures. And um, you know, again, talk about this. This is this is. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious who it is. But what's going on here? Where were you? And what a great shot! Well, thank you. This is uh, Stephen Tyler, and this was the tour opener in two thousand nine in St. Louis. And um, because it was a tour opener, is actually we had kind of better access than the rest of the tour ended up having. Um, after the show, they, never, they didn't allow photographers in the pit. So the photo pit's the area that is right up close to the stage. It's in between the stage and the fans. And it's a mm -hmm. small kind of corridor, basically. And there was a long thrust out from the stage, kind of like a catwalk or extension. And it would cut the pit in two. And so we were allowed to, on one side of it. And I kind of had the feeling that, like, obviously it's very narrow. There's kind of one best, closest part of the stage. So I made sure to be, like, on the heels of the Live Nation rep so I could be right at the front of that line. Um, the closest to the stage, you know, at, right at, um, at that thrust. And it was a moment where, you know, Steven just kind of leans down and starts singing right into my lens. This is the, the Nikon 14 to 24, my favorite lens of all time. And I don't know, I, I, I just happened to be there first because of design, but also he could, he could have picked anyone else. But this kind of combination of a lot of luck, a little bit of preparation um, translates into this photo. I think the preparation's right, and I think it goes back to the the, the triad of lenses, the three lenses you were talking about before having those. Um, are you constantly maneuvering with those? Because there are many times that the action's in front of you, and other times it's not. Um, I assume that's why you're bouncing to your 7200 to try and find something else while you're within that limit of songs? Yeah, so I'll always shoot with two bodies, and that allows me to have, to not waste time changing lenses. I'll generally shoot with the... 24 to 70 and keep that on one body the entire time and then on my second body i'll switch between the 70 to 200 and the 14 to 24 and just that, that's kind of more the you know the extremes so i kind of have my mid-range zoom on all the time just because as we all know that's just a super use, utilitarian lens um, that has a lot of function and then if i want to go ultra wide or tight in i can just um, have that on the second body um and but i'll I'll, I will switch lenses. Generally, it, it helps if you switch in between songs. At least you have a little bit of downtime when the, there's not you know, something right in front of you. But you also have to be, again, you have to be kind of open to what's in front of you. And if you have the wrong lens on, you know, by the time you change lenses for live music, the moment's already passed. So you kind of have to, there's a plan B. Okay, what's the next thing? What can I shoot right in front of me right now in the moment with the lenses that I have mounted? That's so funny because in those moments, I tilt my head down and if something happens and my camera didn't catch it, it didn't happen. It yep. never happened. <laughs> Until then, you're envious of the person that was sitting next to you and you go to their Facebook page or Instagram page or their publication and you see this amazing shot and you just wish you had that in your body of work. Yeah. Um, but uh, great testimony to the quality of work that other people do. But you can miss moments and would you say yeah. it's fair you're going to miss moments? Yeah, you can't be everywhere you know, photographing everything. In live music, photography, like so many things, you're literally shoulder to shoulder with your competition or your peers. And, you know, you're all making images. They're all going to be a little different, but someone's going to get the one shot. You're going to get the shot the next show. Um, and I, I actually love that feeling because it's, I feel like it's healthy competition, not viewing 
you know, your fellow photographer as the enemy, but they're, they're, they're motivating you. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like, who's going to come away with the best shot of that show and mm -hmm. of the tour or of an artist's career. That's always something that, you know, I like to play a little game where it's like, okay, I, I want, I always want that, the image of that show. I want to make, you know, it doesn't always happen. Of course, it, that's a rare thing, but that's always mm -hmm. the goal to, to make that image. And I feel like if you do everything just right, if you make, you know, you're really lucky, you're really good, you're in the right spot, you get the time and the exposure, everything right, you can make the image of that show and maybe the image of that tour, you know, maybe the image of that artist's career to make something that stands the test of time and kind of lives beyond yourself. And that's always kind of, for me, the ultimate goal of kind of chasing those iconic images as a music photographer. Yeah, and I, I found, you just said, and I don't want to overlook this, is that camaraderie uh, in the pit sometimes. And when you're, I, I'm a house photographer at Jones Beach, well, I don't know how much further that's going to go. Um, but um, the reality is, as a house photographer, you're there to try to coordinate photographers too and help out the people escorting in and out. But you got the same crew, you know, it's yep. Christine, it's Andy, it's Wayne, it's all these guys you look forward to um, uh, seeing. And we have some great times together before the concert ever even starts, you know, as we're shooting the different bands going on. But that camaraderie is a great thing. And uh, I beg people, if you're ever in that pit environment, I, I noticed on your blog, uh, ishootshows.com, you have a, an article up there called Shooting in the Pit Etiquette, Pit Etiquette. Uh, and it's important. Guys, go check that out because it's so smart and so important to realize. All try and do the same thing, you know. And it's tough when you're in there because the emotions run high and people all of a sudden, the elbows come and the point, you're leaning. You're going to lean into somebody, so get over it. But it's when you get a little bit of push and you push back, it's, it becomes a really crazy time in the pit, no? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're all, you're going to take your bumps. People are going to bump into you. You know, it's all about respect. Operating mm -hmm. respectfully for both, you know, you to other photographers, to security, to the fans, to the artists themselves. For me, respect is the number one rule. I mean, obviously in life, but in, in specifically in the photo pit. And that's kind of your basis for all your action should be from mutual respect for everyone around you. Talk about this now, extend that, because I want you to talk about how the respect, you know, in your mind plays towards the security and what is your position on the rules within the environment that they give you, the amount of songs, where you can shoot from. Talk about that for a little bit, because I think that's really important. Yeah. I mean, the security, the rules are the rules. The moment that you're violating them by using flash, by you know, standing on the barricade if they don't want you to, if you're blocking other photographers or being disruptive. Um, it's enough to get a pit clear that, that the, you know, there's the house security and there's often, you know, tour security, um, who could clear a pit and just basically push all the photographers out and the photography for that show, regardless of whether the there's, you know, another song or not. Um, and so you should always, you know, obviously act respectful, but whatever the rules are, you have to obey them. The moment you think that you're entitled to another shot or something is the moment that, you know, you can not only end it for yourself and be blacklisted, but have consequences that are, you know, for the whole, for everyone who's shooting that show. Um, and it's not going to be looked on very kindly. <laughs> You're right. And, 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 and it is definite that if you create waves, the entire pit gets cleared and nobody gets to shoot the pictures. But it's hard, you know, that adrenaline rush is there and you, you know, you feel like you you just, I think you have to have confidence in yourself that you're going to be back at another concert if you do the job right and that you'll have other opportunities and that if you're okay with missing things, because you will, you realize that they will come back. And I'm going to realize if I'm in the middle of, of Todd O'Young and Chris O'Young, I may not be getting the best pictures, but that's okay. You know, um, you know, shoot for yourself and shoot the best you can. Talk a little bit about this. I mean, it's not that easy to put a shot together on the fly. What's happening here? So this is the band Slayer, and this was photographed at Mayhem Fest, and I was on assignment for Rolling Stone, and I was just, I had showed up to basically just shoot the live show, and the editor of Rolling Stone, I was working with the, you know, the email me during the day, I was like, hey, if we could get five minutes with the band Slayer, could you do a portrait with them, right before they go on, on stage? And I was like, uh, absolutely, I can, I can do that, um, which is pretty much what I tell Rolling Stone anytime they ask me to do anything. Oh, absolutely, sure. And then, but secretly, I'm sweating bullets. I was like, okay, five minutes of the band. This is kind of like the most high profile band I photographed at the time. You know, it's backstage at a big amphitheater, which sounds maybe, you know, kind of um, fun, but it's actually, it's kind of like this kind of a lot of, there's a lot of just junk everywhere. And there aren't a lot of what you would consider like photogenic locations. And it just happened because the band's gear was loaded on stage because it's literally 
five minutes before they're going on set. Um, their gear trailer was empty. And so we actually ended up shooting in their, in their trailer because it was cleared out. Um, just popped a speed light in the back, had um, an assistant, you know, just boom, a, another speed light into an umbrella and um, made this image. And it, I looked back on the images and from the first frame to the last frame, it was three minutes and 43 seconds. Um, and Kerry King's kind of strumming his guitar the entire time. You know, these guys are pros. He kind of walked on, you know, did the thing. Okay, how do you want us? Posed them up. And it, it felt like it was going by like in an instant. Um, and it's also one of these instances that taught me to, um, you got to fake it. Like the lighting, the first couple of frames, it was bad. It was off. The ratios were not what I had set them, um, were not where I wanted them uh, when I had set up because of the distance and so forth. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of shooting and then the images are like blown out or whatever. And then the band's just kind of standing there and like, oh, it looks great. It looks great, guys. Okay. I'm like, you know, um, you know, spin the dials, get everything dialed in. And just, just, you know, hold on just a couple more, just one more. <laughs> exactly. Just What's one, one more? more. Just one. Oh, it looks great. Just like that. Keep it going. And yeah, um, you know, nail the one shot. And for me, this, this image is, is special because the band actually went on to license it as their official tour promo a couple of years later. Um, so mm. for, for a photo shoot that lasted just a little over, you know, three minutes to make an image that they felt was worthy of their promo image um, for a world tour was, was really special for me. Yeah, very, very quick on the fly. And, you know, a lot of your work uh, ends up becoming portrait work. And I got to tell you, I was blown away by this for one simple fact. I thought that you actually had this set up in a studio, but it wasn't a studio. Tell the story about uh, Katy Perry here and how you photographed her. Yeah, so this is, um, this is also 2009. It's uh, my first assignment for Rolling Stone. They emailed me out of the blue, like, hey, you know, we found your blog. Do you still live in St. Louis? And are you free to shoot Warp Tour for us? And it was a kind of similar situation where I was just shooting, you know, portraits as I could grab them and also the live shows. And Katy Perry, who was then, I think she had won, those was her first single had just come out, but still relatively unknown and walks into the green room where the press room that is where everyone was kind of hanging out and, you know, doing press and interviews. And, you know, I talked to the, the Warped Tour press handler and she's like, oh, you know, this is Katy, you know, she's free for a portrait if you want. And so I literally was just shooting with speed lights they, I didn't even bring uh, light stands because it was so run and gun. I just was set up, I think it was two SB600s, put them on the ground, bounced them off the ceiling, bounced them off the wall. Um, yeah. And this is the image that came out. And, you know, it, it just goes to show you never know who you're going to photograph, um, especially at yeah. these kind of at these festivals where you have these up and coming artists. Um, it could be the next Katy Perry. It could be the next nobody. But photograph everyone you can because you never know. You know, it's kind of a roll of the dice. But you may just have an image that goes on to be someone who's you know the next next big star. Well, that's it. I, I think that's a great point because look at Katy Perry now. She owns a stage. She owns her own shows. May have a small little warm up act, but for the most part, her productions are huge. Um, uh, and uh, you know, one of my buddies, a guy named Brian Samuelson, who we've worked very close together with different bands in different locations, actually went on tour with her. And, you know, he got to shoot a little bit, but uh, there were so many restrictions when you get to that level. So that's a great point. Everybody has the potential to be somebody somewhere else and much bigger. And even if it's not within that band, they could break off and do something solo or go on with another band. And, you know, to me, that picture is far more valuable than anything that's contemporary or current because everybody's getting the current stuff. You know, yep. um, so so very very important. But again, you kind of threw me here because I thought maybe you had a studio set up here and you had to shoot. And uh, to bring up that this was part of Warp Tour, it shows must be how early on in Katie's career it was because for her to be touring in Warp Tour, yeah. it's not one of my favorite shows. Not that it's not great music or it's chaos. You know oh, it, yeah. right? Yeah. I hate I hate tours. <laughs> I hate um, those those big you know uh, festivals. I guess yep. Warp Tour would be considered a festival. Do you feel that anxiety of festivals like I do? It's it's different. That's for sure because there's so many artists you know, performing, they're backstage. It's, it's like you're, you have a full docket. It's not like a normal concert um, where you have, okay, you have like the headliner, maybe one or two openers. With a festival like this, um, you're, you know, there's probably a half a dozen stages. You're going around. It's like hot. You know, you're drenched in sweat. It's probably going to be humid. It's on some sort of, you know, in a parking lot somewhere. Um, so it's not the easiest shooting conditions. Um, and again, you have to, sort of, you know, to be scrappy. I think that's kind of what shooting a lot of these things taught me. So if you can shoot an image like this where it's, okay, you get one keeper from something where someone just walks on, you know, it's not styled, it's not, you know, like a full day shoot. It makes those full day shoots so much easier if you can kind of 
get that one image in like a couple minutes. It makes, you know, a bigger production, a cakewalk. Yeah. And I, I think I found myself too, when you talk about that, you know, approaching the stage as if it were a studio set. And looking for that moment where it's a portrait, it's not an action shot, you know, and that, that performer is like staring into your camera or you've created that portrait type environment and, and, and all done while things are going on live and stage. But what are some of the tips? You're shooting a festival. There are times yeah. the bands go off. There are three or four or five different stages. What's your strategy to get to where you want to go? It's basically to prioritize the artists. So obviously the headliner is going to be pretty easy. You're going to you know, do one or, one or the other. Um, but to basically make a schedule so, and to allow yourself time to go between the stages, um, look at the map of the festival grounds, see if stages are close together, if you can maybe cover an act on the way to another act, um, and just kind of like get your game plan for the day um, and balance that with be between the onstage performances with, you know, are you going to go to the press area where people are doing interviews and posing for artist portraits? Um, make room for that. And, you know, if you, if you're, if you are really dedicated to the portraits, make sure you have enough time allotted to make, you know, make those connections, set those up with the publicists, um, and then cover the live stuff as well. Um, so, but planning is essential for festival coverage. Um, but at the same time being flexible, you need to have your plan A and then your plan B, your plan C, uh, if, you know, maybe a pit might be full. Um, there's some artists who might limit the number of photographers who can photograph them or close it. So if you want to, if you definitely want to photograph an artist, make sure you get there early so that if that happens, you're going to be, you know, you're in there because some of these big festivals like Lollapalooza or Coachella, like there are just hundreds of photographers there. What, what know, feels like that. And the, the pits fill up. Yeah. No, very, very good tips. A lot of times what I'll do is uh, I'll snap a photo of the timesheets or sometimes they have a big wall that they put all the times up for each of the yep. bands and yep. which stage they're playing on and shoot a picture of that. So I have that, but you're right. You well, talk to me about your energy level from the first, you know, show at say Lollapalooza to you gotta, you gotta keep yourself going to that very last act. Cause that's not going to go until like nine o'clock at night, oh, right? Yeah. You start yeah. at noon I mean, or 11 AM and yeah. You know, what are, what are you doing for your conditioning? <laughs> are you working out? <laughs> <Are> you... <laughs> I think it's just, you know, you're definitely getting the first festival of the, of the season. You're going to be destroyed after that. But I think you build up this kind of, you know, definitely endurance. Um, and maybe you don't get there at noon. Maybe you wait to get there at, you know, three. Save your energy. Stay out of like the noonday sun. Drink a lot of water. Catch shade when you can. But you have, you have to pace yourself. It's, you know, it's definitely a marathon, not a sprint for festivals yeah. like that. Absolutely, because you could be shot and then all of a sudden you got no energy for that last act and that's not a good place to be. Now, I want to talk about this picture because I know you work with Chris a lot, right? You guys yep. Uh, yep. Uh, do shoots together, you shoot concerts together, you go on tour together with certain bands. We're going to talk about Jason Aldean a little bit. Uh, I know you said uh, earlier in conversation that you, know, you guys have a rule of you work together, you light it, someone pushes the button. You know, and someone lights it. Talk about this picture and uh, it's Keith Richards, man. I mean, Keith that, Richards. To just have that moment, I wish I would have that moment in, in life, to just be in front of someone like that. I, I don't want to call it starstruck, but I just think it's a moment. You know, it's just a memory for you. Uh, Absolutely. And, but when someone is a part of a group like the Rolling Stones or the Beatles or, you know, um, some epic bands that go from generation to generation, it's got to feel good about having a picture like this or oh, being yeah. a part of it. Yeah. So my brother Chris and I, we shoot together as much as possible. We basically shoot the same thing. I started shooting concerts first, got into photography a little before he did, but he saw what I was doing. He's like, hey, that looks like fun. So he, as a younger brother, it was one of the very few things that I started doing first um, after a lifetime of following in his footsteps. And so, but, you know, we shoot the same thing. We love shooting rock and roll, love shooting music, and we like, love to work together as much as possible. So when we work on artist portraits like this, one of us will generally light it, the other will press the button, but we basically both own the image. We both, you know, have it in our portfolios. So Chris actually pressed the button for this one. I lit it, but it, we, I feel it's our collaboration. So we love working together in that manner. And yeah, we probably had about 30 seconds for Keith Richards like this. He kind of walked on, did his thing, was all smiles. Um, and then after about 30 seconds, someone in his, his, his entourage, you know, snapped their fingers and said, okay, let's go. And they, they went on to the next thing. And we, Chris and I huddled up and like, did you get it? Did you get it? And like, he's like, you know, we got a couple of images that we loved. And, um, but it was, you know, again, you have to work as a music photographer on your feet. You have to be ready to get one frame, you know, whether it's one second, 30 seconds, five minutes, if you need to be able to perform regardless of what the duration is, because you never know when someone's going to pull the plug like they did in this instance. 
Um, and where, where was Keith Richards here? Where were you guys? So this is at the iHeartRadio uh, Theater in New York. And he was there to speak about his recent book. And before that, part of the, the package that iHeartRadio does is they'll, they, they love having portraits of people who visit the, studio, um, the theater. And so this was basically a hand-painted backdrop that Chris and I set up. It was in a hallway where Keith was going from one you know, part of the, the theater to the other. So he was kind of doing the circuit. And we had this set up because we knew that he would, he'd have to pass this way. We could have this one very brief opportunity that, you know, they, that they'd have to do basically it, it, for however much time they gave us. So those 30 seconds um, were really, it was really just clutch here and kind of, again, making the most of what you have. When, have you ever had the great pleasure of photographing meet and greets? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's actually, it's funny because the meet and greet is not that different than this where you have a backdrop that's set up and people coming through you and you have, instead of 30 seconds, you just have, you know, one or two clicks um, you know, you might review the images, make sure the eyes are open, and then it's on to the next. Do you, you talk about those publicists though? Uh, okay, time to move on. Yep. Man, if, first of all, it's, it's a good paying job when you shoot meet and greets. Um, so don't ever discount those people out there. If you get asked to shoot them, you charge for those and, and they pay good. But it is a time thing. And uh, I remember uh, getting a call uh, from, from uh, Live Nation. It says, uh, you know, um, Tony Bennett, and Lady Gaga, they're playing in the city. Uh, can you go do the meet and greet? Uh, the photographer they had this last night, they fired. And I said, I'm curious. You know, I, I'd be happy to do it. But, you know, again, I need to go buy it. They wanted me to buy a backdrop because I didn't have one, the whole thing. But the long and short of it was, um, I said, what, why did the guy get fired? Did he do something? He said, no, he didn't shoot fast enough. And I said, well, how many people? He's like 90 to 100 people back there. And he didn't do it fast enough. <laughs> And I'm like, well, how quickly did he do it per person? Well, about, uh, you know, 15 seconds a person. I was like, I can't, I can't do better than that. I'm sorry. Um, to have to jump through the hoops to get everything I need, I'll, I'll pass on this. But thank you for the opportunity. But that's a pressure shoot. I mean, boom, like you say, shoot. Because now to me, it's the most important part of all this, the fans that yep. pay for this meet and greet. And they just want that one picture. Like you said, check to see that the eyes are open because the last thing you want to give them is something that they can't socialize, right? Um, yep. But that's, that's a big part of, of the whole, I think, uh, the world of, of going to a concert. Um, fan shots. Talk yeah, about how the important fans. These, these, these types of shots are. And, and I'm going to bring up some things that really bother me. But talk <laughs> about this picture. Where was it? Why did you shoot it? Why is it so important and part of this uh, defining image? portfolio. So, so this was a photograph at Leeds Festival in the UK. And this was a special one for me because I got to shoot with my friends, um, Danny North, Andrew Witten, and they were running the festival, the official festival team, the photo team for Leeds Festival. And they asked me to come over um, and just had a great time. Not only just shooting with friends, but being part of the official crew, making images for, um, you know, social and the, the website and so forth. And for my particular assignment for this, this is major laser under this enormous, enormous tent. And my assignment for this show was to get crowd shots and atmosphere shots for this particular artist. And at first when I got the assignment, I was kind of like, oh, you know, it's, it's crowd shots. Like how good could that be? Um, because as a mm. music photographer, you can probably empathize where you want to be as close as possible to the performer. And I was like, okay, crowd shots, whatever. Cause I'm, I'm literally, you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, a hundred yards away here. Uh, but there was one point where um, the artist, I think it was Diplo, asked everyone to throw their shirts up in the air and hundreds of people did it. And if I'd been at the front of the pit, it just wouldn't have been the same experience where, you know, it would um, turn around, you would have gotten an A shot. But this being, you know, with the stage in the, in the background, everyone's shirts flying up, um, it was just a special moment for me and kind of, you know, taught me the importance of when you're covering for an official festival like this and you're on the official team that is, you know, the fan experience is critically important. You know, like you had mentioned, they're the ones who pay to put on the show. And making images that tell their story is what's going to sell tickets for the next year because the artists might change, but that fan experience, how much fun people are having in the images you can show, that's what's commercially valuable and what, as a music photographer, it's not just showing what's on stage, but you know, the whole environment and lifestyle is what's important to the producers, the production, um, the promoters, and commercial brands who want to associate themselves with live music. You know, it goes back to that word you used before, respect. And, and 
without the fans, there wouldn't be a show. And to me, in cleaning house and working as a house shooter, you want to make sure that none of the photographers are stepping out of line. Because the last thing you, I would want to be part of a conversation is people who've gone home, they spent money, good money to be at this show, and they're talking about how the photographer blocked them as opposed to enjoying the concert. And I personally want everybody at that show to enjoy a great concert experience, you know, short of if they drank too much and threw up on the person in front of them. That's not my problem. But, yeah, listen, you know that happens, right? Um, <laughs> especially at those day festivals when it's really hot. But, but that respect goes all the way around from the artist to the stage to security to the people that work the venue uh, the escorts that escort you in and out, you know, and there's a lot of, like you say, entitlement, I think, and a bit, bit of pushback and, you know, that sort of, you know, pounding of the chest that I'm here and I'm in the front. So it's my world. Guess what, guys? It's not your world. Go back to what Todd said before. It's about making that performer look great, making the band look great, making the fans feel great. And shots like this, don't underestimate the commercial value because a lot of venues, regardless of where this may be shot, um, a lot of commercial companies will buy this as a commercial photo, which means the money is up here instead oh, yeah. of maybe a couple of hundred bucks for a one-time use. Um, you know, you walk into the elevator at Jones Beach Theater, beautiful shots, you know, uh, of, of, of the work. And I'll toss out a name. I know you probably know uh, great rock and roll photographer, Kevin Mazur. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I feel very proud that some of my pictures are shared around the venue, just like his with the work that he's done and the epic work he's done. Yeah. So, yeah. but these types of crowd shots are killer when it comes to a value beyond that venue and 100%. beyond that band. Um, talk about this drummer. Cause I know we want to finish off with you now touring with uh, Jason Aldean and the work you and, and Chris are doing. But I know you mentioned this shot's important to you. Why? For me, well, I mean, one, it's, it's Questlove. He's probably the most, world's most famous drummer, someone everyone loves. But for me, what this image represents is the, my favorite piece of photography advice that I received when I was just starting out, which was this, don't forget the drummer. I was mm -hmm. with a local band in St. Louis backstage right before they went on, and the guitarist was kind of like tuning his guitar, strumming it, and for whatever reason, he didn't even look up at me. He said, Todd, don't forget the drummer. Photographers always forget the drummer. And didn't elaborate on it other more than that, but just kind of went back to playing his guitar. But for me, it stuck with me because um, I've kind of taken it up as a mantra. Because drummers, as you know, Mike, I mean, you, you make amazing drummer um, images with your, pro your drummer love project. Um, drummers are hard. They're at the back of the stage. They're dimly lit. They're obscured by their drum kit. Um, they're in constant motion, which makes it incredibly difficult to get clean crisp shots that we love to get as uh, to make as photographers and because of that they're much easier subjects than drummers um, but be at the same time because of all these challenges they're some of the most rewarding subjects you could possibly have in rock and roll and i know you yeah. feel the same way because when you get an, a great image of the drummer you know it's it's something special you know lead singers lead guitarists those are easy they're playing to you they're at the front of the stage um, but that's, to work that's who hard. everybody's shooting, right? Yeah. Everybody goes yeah. in there with yeah. that mind. I got to get, you know, uh, the lead singer. Yeah. I've got to get the main, you know, person in the act. And then you think about it, even in the promo shots, that's the person that's in the front as everybody kind of distances, you know, towards the back in the hierarchy. And the drummer is always mm -hmm. in the back. So I totally share that sentiment with you. Yep. But um, you're right. And that's the drummer love actually came from someone here, um, used to work here at Nikon named Andrew as I was covering concerts. Don't forget to show the drummer some love. Yep. And, um, you know, I mean, to me, it was just a quirky thing. We were, you know, working and um, promoting a, a tour with Nickelback yep. and their dumb, drummer, Daniel Adair. And to me, it, it, look at the angle you're at, right? It's a beautiful photo. You got lucky. His face is over the top. You see a stick. Toughest part about the drummer, right, is all the things oh, yeah. blocking you. That, that, that between you and the drummer, there's cymbal stands and there's pipes and there's racks and there's crap. And to get that clear shot of yeah, that face is almost angle. impossible. And that's why I put the remote cameras on drum kits because I'm just yep. too lazy to stand up on stage, <laughs> nor did I have the option to do that. So, yep. but yeah, now I love this picture for everything. The lighting, the, the face, the drumstick, you see a little bit of the drum kit. It's not too much, um, but I, I share that love of this, but you have obviously more of an emotional connection to it uh, and, as well. And along the ahead. lines of this, um, the don't forget the drummer, I mean, I feel like it's applicable to no matter what here. you shoot. Yeah it's you can find something like this there are all the always these underrepresented subjects or these mm -hmm. difficult subjects that other people are going to pass over and if you, you find your your drummer in whatever genre of photography it is and give them love and focus on them 
you've got this built-in audience of something that's special to you and this value that you can offer that people are going to, you know, people are overlooking and it's going to mm-hmm. be this value added and a way of standing out and building um, kind of something that's unique to you specifically. Unique and it creates great relationships, which then open up, you know, to other members of the band. And um, we're going to talk about one of your friends uh, from the Aldine clan, the group um, that uh, you've had a chance to photograph and become friends with in the next series of shots after this next one coming up. Stage access. Talk a little bit about this. How do you get here? How are you standing behind uh, the subject that you're shooting? So this is the band Extra, Extra Pan, and this is the lead singer, Yoshiki. And they'd hired me, or co-lead singer, um, they'd hired me for this show. Uh, Madison Square Garden was always a dream of this band. So there's this legendary rock band from Japan. And they always wanted to play MSG. And they hired me, they found my website. And when I first signed on, I asked the manager, is there anywhere Yoshiki doesn't want me to be? Is there anywhere that is off limits? And she said, no, you have carte blanche to do whatever you want, go wherever you want. And I really took that as, okay, that's my directive. I am charged with making the best possible images for the show, for the band's dream show at the garden. And me personally, I'm a, a mild mannered guy. I'm not the be in the lights on stage guy. I'm the hang back. Like I want, I don't want to be part of the show, but because the band, they wanted these images, they wanted it, you know, they, they spared no expense for this show. It was a one-off and there was the most epic production I've ever seen at a concert practically. And this was the finale where like a huge epic amount of confetti's going off. Yoshiki's dropping to his knees, wailing on the mic. And I knew this moment was going to happen because we'd been in rehearsals and I knew I needed to be dead center to get this image that I wanted. And there was even a, um, a band's, the band's photography, the other photographer that is, um, who came from Japan. And during the show, I was, you know, I was getting on stage and, and doing my thing. And he told me, I was like, only I can be on stage. You cannot be on stage. But I had had it from the manager that I could go anywhere and do everything. And so that was my charge uh, to deliver the best possible images. So despite, you know, again, I'm not, I don't want to be out there where people can see me. You know, um, but to make these images, you have to be out there. Um, and so just timing it. And for me, again, shooting on stage at Madison Square Garden, what, who's, you know, dream isn't that as a, as a music photographer. So being hired by the band, shooting all access, you know, AAA, um, and having that trust and respect was just a tremendous milestone for me as a photographer. Well, I think it goes back to that respect word that you just say again, and the fact that that stage, I mean, there's a protocol right? Especially if there's fireworks, pyro, things like that, other things within the act and, you know, the confetti blowing out, you've got to watch out where you're standing. I mean, there's all kinds of things, but just realizing that everybody's got a job. It's not just the band that, you know, they have X amount of time to get out in X, X amount of time to get out of Madison square garden. They've got to pack up and they've got to load trucks and get out or else they're fined if they're in, in there too late because maybe there's a basketball game the next day or another concert coming in. So there's all kinds of rules. And that's why, having the respect for the stage and understanding the environment makes it so much easier because people look at you and go back, Oh, Todd was there. And I know for a fact that you and Chris are so discreet on stage. Cause I remember when Aldine came through Jones beach, the very first time I'm shooting and I see somebody quietly kneeling down, which by the way, I don't wear black at concerts because I'm morbid. I wear black because you blend into the black oh, yeah. and the dark and the shadows, yeah, right? Black. So never colors when I know I'm working stage. And, um, but I see you kneeling down there with your cameras like, oh, hell, that's Todd. And then you guys came out, and I remember we saw each other back at the soundboard, uh, and uh, we had some good times together uh, during that show. But, uh, but beautiful. And, and, and now we get into this. As we start to wind down, we got about uh, six minutes or so left. Um, but uh, I know you've done a lot of work with uh, Jason Aldean and his group, and the drummer is Rich, correct? Yes, correct. Um, and you, Rich, and I are going to work together somewhere down oh, yeah. the road uh, with the Drummer Love remotes. But um, talk about what it's like in the environment, and, and we'll punch through some of these pictures as we start to close out of what's going on here. So for this image, this is uh, Jason at Fenway in 2013. And for me, this is a lucky shot. You know, he, Jason is one of those performers. He just does his thing. He's not playing to the camera at all. But for whatever reason... Um, decided to, to interact with the camera. And for this, I had the, you know, the camera up on a, on a monopod 
was trying for this something a little different just to get a unique shot with Jason and the crowd and the stage. And for whatever reason, Jason decided to kick out at the camera. So I had the camera popped up on a monopod. I have a remote trigger. I'm firing away blind. And because, you know, the, the, the fisheye is wide enough, I'm pretty sure it got it, but who knows? So I, I you know, pop the camera down to the moment this happens, the moment after it happens, check the image. It's in focus. It's sharp. And this image was, it went on to be used as the, the truck wrap for the next year's tour. Um, so right. that was tremendous to see just you know again super cool and um it was 2013 was the first year we did tour photography for him went out again the next year and just having you know this image on all the you know the semi trailers was was really phenomenal that's it's gorgeous yeah i I had worked with uh, jason bonham in the drummer project and uh he ended up using a shirt that they turned into an illustration a shot uh, they turned into an illustration on a t-shirt and i know it sounds corny but man it kind of lights you up a little bit that uh he thought enough of that shot, you know, to want to use it, um, you know, within Absolutely. some of his commercial yeah. stuff. But, but talk a little bit about now this environment. It's not going in and getting three songs, kind of like the uh, performers at Madison Square Garden. You got a little more freedom. You and your brother get to roam the stage and shoot stuff. I, I've often found, too, though, when you see one show, most shows are choreographed just like the next one. So there's Absolutely. not a lot of variation from show to show. So there's a big advantage there. But talk about that and your strategy as you move forward. Uh, in shooting around the stage and the types of shots that you're creating. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, you still have the checklist and you're still working through shots because, and the difference with tour photography is that you get another shot. You know what's happening. You know where to be when the lighting is doing what you want or not. And you can take a much more methodical and strategic approach. You're like, okay, you don't need to be making the same images over and over night after night. So you can take risks, you can take chances and to, you know, take that monopod fisheye shot um, because it might happen one night, it might not happen the other. Um, and you can take um, the opportunity to make images like this. This is my good friend, Rich Redmond, drummer for Jason Aldean. And when you have that trust and you're working with somebody really closely, you can go up on stage, stick, the, stick a fisheye you know, in their kit. This is the, the Nikon 8 to 15 millimeter uh, fisheye My favorite, zoom. my favorite. So good, yeah, yeah. so good. And this is uh, on the new Z7. Um, love shooting this and yeah, you just, it's another kind of a level of working where you have the trust of the band, the crew, you know, and you're kind of just, you know, you're out there with them. You know, I know, I know Baron Woman is, is famous for saying, you know, they're playing their, their fenders and I was playing my Nikon. Um, and mm-hmm. it's the same kind of thing when you're doing photography, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're not the band band, but you're out there, you're doing your job. And if you take that mentality, you know, just like, you know, a, a guitar tech isn't, you know, afraid or, you know, bashful and they need to go out stage, on stage, give someone the guitar, come back, change that stuff out. They're just doing their job. They're walking out there, they're confident, they're going to get it done. And as a photographer approaching uh, the show like that, you know, you have your checklist, you know, go on stage, do it. You're not part of the show, come back um, and, just, you know, just do it, um, you know, discreetly, respectfully, and kind of just get it done. Mm-hmm. Do you do a lot of research, uh, even though you're touring and, you know, you get those consecutive nights? What about the bands you're not touring with? Do you do any research, like song lists and things like that? So if you're shooting three or two songs up front, you know exactly what yes. you're dealing with, with the tempo and the length of the song, typically? Yeah. Unless, yeah. of course, you're shooting Dave Matthews, because don't worry about getting two songs with Dave Matthews, because they'll play yeah, an half, hour about for about a half songs. hour, yeah. For yeah. Songs. Um, but yeah, do you do any research? If you're shooting editorial and you know you only have three songs, what I used to do a lot when I would shoot for publications would just go on YouTube, go and mm-hmm. search for, you know, the band, you know, live that, that tour name or the date, um, the year and see what they open with because bands, they're, they're creatures of habit. They're going to play the same couple of songs. They're going to play the same set list, to be honest. Most of the time they might switch up a few yeah, songs. Definitely but, an opening song going to be the yeah. same every show. Yeah. Cause right. the production is tied to that. It's, they've, it's, it's very designed and choreographed. But, um, and so, yeah, go on YouTube, search what the first songs are. Go to, you know, Setlist FM and see what they're going to be playing. Search for the song names live, you know, that mm-hmm. year and see what's happening. There's probably going to, if, if there's a move, if there's like a choreographed thing that's going to happen, you can see it. You'll know where to stand in the pit. If the singer is doing something that you want to cover, you know where to be in relation or if, you know, the lead guitarist is doing something spectacular, it's going to be their signature move. You know, they they there's stage blocking there's choreography for these um 
you know, shows and, and the band members are very much creatures of habit where they're going to be in the same place roughly at the same time. Um, they're going right. to put their foot on the wedge around the same time of that song because it's their solo and so forth. So if you can kind of key yourself into those little, um, you know, those bits of research, you're going to be so much, you know, ahead of the game in knowing where to be, have a leg up on their competition if they haven't done the same kind of research. Absolutely. And, and a lot of times I'll actually go to those set list uh, websites. I'll put a song list, a playlist together. And if I know I'm working with a certain drummer for that show, I actually will listen to that, close my eyes. And all I listen to are the drum beats, yep. where that drum is going to hit hard and where it may be soft, knowing which songs I'm not going to be aggressive on and knowing the songs that you have to go crazy on, you know, shooting, because it's very easy to blow out cards you know, even with two slots um, uh, at times to, uh, to run out of card space if you don't pace yourself uh, the right way. I absolutely love this picture. And I know uh, we're winding down. I think we got one other shot after this. But um, what's going on here? This is, <laughs> it's, it's such so a killer is, this shot. This is Jason and his son Memphis. And this was uh, from rehearsals year before the tour opened uh, the, earlier this year. So this is one of the last concerts I shot actually early this year. I think this was in January, at the end of January. And um, Memphis, his son, was just running around during soundcheck. You can see he has these um, kind of like earmuffs on to protect his ears. He has like stuffed animals. And he was literally running in circles. He was, you know, just loving being out there. Jason, I know, like, likes having his family out there. You know, they get to see what dad gets to do for a living. And um, they had stopped, you know, playing. And, and Memphis runs up to the stage. And Jason was, you know, knelt down and just was waving at him. And, you know, I shot this image. I texted it to Jason and his wife, Brittany, and they, you know, posted it to Instagram, I think that same night. And it's just rewarding to have this kind of trust and access um, and be, to be able to deliver images like this to the family that are, that are personally um, important to them. And, you know, I was talking to Jason the next day and he's like, oh, thank you for that photo. You know, it's a wall hanger for sure. So like, thank you for that. And it was just imp really special for me to be able to give that to him. You know, these aren't per se the images that I'm paid to make in terms of like for management. They're after these kind of, big hero shots with the ad mat, but being able to be led into kind of the inner circle and to make images like these, this that are more intimate that not everyone gets to see um, or make, that's really special as a photographer for me. That I think is, is so true. And um, I, I think, you know, you had mentioned to me, you're not on every stop with them. You pick mm -hmm. X amount, but really just quickly, as we go to the last shot, um, this is a grind for them, right? This is not, pleasure at times it's fun it looks good they make it look good but this is not exactly the coolest thing to have to be on tour for 600 shows i mean it's it's insane now speak to that a little bit from the band's perspective yeah the, the energy is very different if you go on if you you know are at the start of the tour everyone's like you know they're, they're they're happy to be there obviously it's a job that they love but the energy is very different at the, at, for the last shows of a tour. If you've ever, you know, anyone who works in the music industry, you know, because it's tough. Um, even with country music, which goes, you know, they generally play, you know, they might play Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They're on the bus back to Nashville uh, Saturday night, they're home Sunday. They'll go back on the road on Wednesday night. So even that's a little different than a rock show where they might be out for months or, you know, weeks at a time, certainly. Even the country act, it's still, a, it's still a grind and it wears on you not being in one place for an extended period of time. Um, so there's definitely a different energy at the end of a tour when people are like, all right, I'm just ready for a couple months off. Um, but it's still, you know, it's, it's, it's really a family when you go out there. Um, so as much fun or not as people are having, it's still, you know, you're with a tight group, but a tight knit group of people. And, you know, who generally everyone's, you know, they're, it really is like a family. It's kind of like this, a traveling circus um, and everyone's kind of signed up for the same thing. Um, but it's, it is special to be part of that, even jumping on for, you know, specific shows and just getting to be part of that energy. Yeah, beautiful. You're right. It's a great family atmosphere. So close out with this shot. What does this mean to you? Why did you want to close with this? I wanted to close with this because when I started my journey as a music photographer, I was just... I wasn't, I didn't, wasn't a music photographer. I was simply a fan with a camera. And for me, when I photograph live music, I still feel like this guy looks. Like this is how I feel when I'm in, you know, in the pit photographing metal or folk or whatever it is. Like I just love it. It's a, it's a thrill and it's a rush. And I also feel that if I can make images that the fans love, I know that I've done my job. Regardless of who hires me, whether it's management, the band, a promoter, I know that if I make images the fans love, if I make images of their favorite artists that they want to put on the wall, 
I know that everything else is taken care of. I know that my client is going to be satisfied if I can make those images that, that highlight what fans love about their artists, that showcase them as their heroes, as musicians that they worship or respect. And so whenever I make images as a music photographer, I'm looking to make images that the fans want to see. Mm, beautiful. Beautifully said. Let me uh, bring you back up full screen. Um, this, this is amazing. This is a special treat for me because we share the same love Absolutely. and exactly that same vibe. You said, uh, uh, although uh, for me and the pace that I keep having the summer off is not a horrible thing. We will get back to concerts and everything will be safe. I'm sure of that. Um, but thank you so much, Todd, uh, for your insight here. Uh, your Instagram is at Todd O'Young. Yep. Um, if you're as fortunate as I am, you may be one day, uh, indoctrinated into the bro young group. <laughs> um, I, maybe I think I'm the only a bro young, um, outside I of remember. you and your brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but no, this is great. And, and, and whether this is something you do for a living or something you do for fun, whether it's concerts, uh, my daughter playing the cello, a lot of these rules apply and, and you just have to work within that environment. But thank you so much for giving us your time. Great, great insight. Thank you so much, Mike. It's been, it's been a lot of fun to talk with you. Thank you. Those of you tuning in to the Creators Hour, Todd Young, check it out. If you want to learn about shooting concerts, go to ishootshows.com, uh, Todd's blog, and, and I'm sure you'll see tips and tricks from he and his brother, and certainly the Pit Etiquette, one of the latest articles that's up there. Um, check out NikonUSA.com backslash Creators Hour to see some of the other interviews we've done with Nikon ambassadors and very epic photographers uh, to check out that schedule, what we've done, and what's about to come. Hopefully, we'll keep this going. But uh, check out Todd if you want to jump over to Nikon USA uh, and, and our Instagram page. Todd's going to ask, uh, answer questions and he asks me anything. Um, so, um, uh, so check that out too. For Nikon, I am Mike Corrado. Thank you for spending time with us. Get out there, make great pictures, share them with us, share them with the world, be inspired, and uh, we will see you soon. Everybody out there, be safe.